I'm turning my attention now to the power supply audio amp area. I removed the two original electrolytics while uh, cleaning up the chassis and I'm now working on restuffing them. Took the cardboard covers off. I'll reinstall them after I'm done restuffing the caps. This guy I cut open and cleaned the insides out and drilled a couple holes. I'll feed the positive leads through there. In the past, I drilled a third hole for the negative, but what I'm thinking I can do is reuse these original grounding clips, which on both caps press up against the outside. Insulating cardboard goes over that, and then the mounting clamp, so they're held very rigidly, and the contact against the side of the can is what feeds the negative signal, or negative side of the cap through, while insulating it from the chassis. Well, because this set is transformerless, uh, and the chassis isn't ground, it's really handy to have these as tie points. This is a negative bus kind of running throughout the set here. So there are a few connections shown as ground, which actually do go to the chassis. But most of them reference this line running through right here. That is a negative return of power supply. And for example, that goes to the negative lug on this guy. So it would really be handy to have a lug there because the, a number of components and wires will attach to it. The problem with that is if I mount a new cap inside, how do I connect it to this? Can't really solder to aluminum that very easily anyways. I used to just run two wires out the bottom and they would attach and there'd be plenty of points to tie to around here. But in this set, there are a number of components that use the capacitors for the tie points. I'd really like to have this. So what I decided I would do is simply drill a small hole through the side and you can see the outline of where this was originally. So I will feed a wire through there connected to the capacitor which is solderable and, I'll, and this is solderable so I'll just connect that through there. I suppose I could also use a self-tapping screw and attach it on there as well and then uh, solder up the wire on the inside. Now as for the center well, originally that was an aluminum rod running down the middle. Here's the remains of it. Can't, again, can't solder very well to aluminum, so what they did is they crimped the steel piece around the soft aluminum. That's great, I could reuse that, except again I have the problem of attaching a new capacitor to that. Could do it just by friction. But I figure I'll just I just pried this apart a little bit, pop that out, and I'll use a bit of this, which is tin plated copper wire, very solderable, same diameter. I'll uh, heat it up and slide this bin of insulated material off, put that on there, crimp it down, slide it through, and then attach my capacitor on the other side. So positive here and negative through the hole over to this guy. I think that I'll remount it and it'll look just like the original and I will have my secure insulated tie points. Similarly this, where there are two lugs, I just drilled holes through the Bakelite, feed my positive leads for the dual suction caps up through here and for the negative I'll go through the side and solder onto this and this will go like so. And then cardboard insulating, hold it all together, I remount it, and got my three tie points. Alright, so that is that. The rest of it, I already restuffed the Bakelite blocks last time I did this. A few original resistors left in here, those will go. And I'll uh, double check the wiring. Which leaves this, the big power resistor. I experimented it earlier with replacing that with either a diode or capacitor rectifier because it does generate a bit of heat. For now I'm just going to leave it in there. It still functions fine. Yeah it kicks out quite a bit of heat but uh, probably playing this a whole lot and it works so why not. Uh, but uh, later on I may uh, put in a lower power more efficient 
uh, replacement and uh, Usually these are prop riveted on, but I just realized this is actually attached with screws, so easy to take that out and mount a terminal strip in there and uh, connect in a more efficient replacement. Okay, here's what I came up with. I realized a larger hole would help out, and also if I was going to solder the wire onto this, I was going to leave a bit of a bump. And I want it to be recessed so when I put on carbon insulation it's not sticking out. So I just stuck a small screwdriver down into the hole and just whacked it a few times to leave a dimple, which will serve as a little solder cup. And I ran some bus wire through, attached up the negative lead, attached a positive lead to my new uh, anode, and put some heat shrink tubing around that. Add a little bit of heat shrink tubing around the negative lead just for extra protection. Threaded up the uh, bus wire through that hole, so that's connected now. The trick is to pull down on the bus wire while getting that anode to go through the center hole. Which may be a little tricky, but I did kind of a dry run before attaching the uh, negative lead and it's, it's possible. Oh, and if you notice that uh, uh, noise in the background, that is a fan, but it's a newer fan than the old rattly one I used to have, so I'm hoping it's not as distracting to you guys. I think this would be a little bit easier if I... After a short while it occurred to me this would be a lot easier if I attached a guide wire to the positive lead as well, so I just did so. And it would also make this a lot easier if I had a much longer piece of this thick bus wire for the anode, but alas, I don't. Now, the other reason I'm doing this, I should mention, is that I also want to kind of practice techniques for when I do more valuable radios like my 37690, which I intend to stuff all the caps on. And there we go. Anode and cathode. And I'll just trim this off a bit. Nice good solder blob. Oop. Put that on the right way. And then trim that off flush. I sand it down a little. And I uh, secure that with a bit of glue. And there we go. One rebuilt cap. And normally I would uh, reattach the top. but uh, And I will on this, but really. This is going to go over the whole thing, so uh, nobody's going to be seeing it anyways. I slid the insulating base back over the cap, used a glob of RTV silicone to help stabilize that. And that goes like so, and it remounts on top of the chassis. I just finished wiring everything back together. Hope I got it right. Here are those rebuilt caps. I think that's a little bit neater than when I had the terminal strips down in there. And you may have noticed resistors have been replaced. Yeah, uh, they were pretty much all out of spec. And what I used are 1 watt Vichy resistors. They may look like quarter watt or half watt, but there's actually a full 1 watt. I ordered up a whole bunch of 1 and 2 watt resistors in this style. I like that brown look. It's not as jarring as the bright blue metal film resistors. And in bulk, these are actually pretty expensive, inexpensive rather, um, ranging from like five to eight cents a piece, depending on who you get them from and what the quantity is. Okay, I finally got everything back together and I believe wired up correctly, so time for a little power-up test. 
don't have the speaker hooked up yet though. Uh, test uh, to see that we have filament continuity and uh, that we got some B+. The curious thing about this radio, I was just reminded when reading your comments, is that the reason for this design that I was questioning about having the extra filter chokes and filter caps when I just use an AC transformer is that this radio was designed to run off of AC or DC 115 volts alternating or direct current there were areas of the country that still had DC I think some up until fairly recently 60s, 70s, 80s uh, just typically just like one single building uh, major metropolitan area and I think the reason they delayed converting is that they would have to convert everything inside the building like the big motors driving elevators for example it's easier just to take modern uh, AC and convert it to DC and power just that one building anyways I digress so another curious thing about this design is that the field coil on the speaker is not used to filter the power supply. So here we've got a rectifier, which is just uh, two sections in parallel. So it's just a half wave rectifier off the AC line. So you get a lot of ripple and not that much voltage really. And after that, it comes up through here and goes to this filter choke, this filter choke, and the field coil. And the return of the field coil goes right down uh, to to ground essentially so uh, through through the AC line so they're just passing DC through this field coil just to energize it so that the speaker will, uh, will work uh, no permanent magnet they uh, energized it with so just burning off energy to, to make that electro into an electromagnet all right so without the speaker being connected I can just put a DC voltmeter across these two wires and see what kind of voltage we get now without the speaker being attached we're not getting a full load and of course we won't hear any sound but at least give me some idea if I got things wired back up right so plugged into my isolation transformer important thing to have when working on transformerless sets and here we go well, it seems to be wired right. It's got a pilot light and tube filaments are glowing and no smoke, so that's a great sign. I'm not 100% certain I got that hooked up right, but I think I do, except backwards. I couldn't tell which was a positive and which was a negative just from looking at these wires. Well, the voltage is awfully low. I might not have them identified right, because unfortunately on this schematic, they don't tell you what color or which wires. Sure, the wires are faded a little bit. At least I can tell some are striped and some aren't. But they don't tell you what's what on here. And tracing them into the radio is a little tricky because some of that goo from the transformers has leaked onto the wires and they're discolored. And I just really can't tell. But uh, that sure doesn't look right. <laughs> so, do a little more investigating. I hope I just have the, uh, the wrong wires clipped up here on the voltmeter sure enough I had the wires hooked up incorrectly I took the time to trace out the wiring and I believe I have it correct now so let's give this a try It's more like it. Service info says there should be 115 volts. Is also in parallel with that field coil is this filter cap, and they show it as 115 VDC. Now I do not have the load in there with the speaker, so I'm not surprised it's a little high. So uh, I don't see any reason not to proceed with hooking up that speaker. I disconnected earlier because this is one of the types of Filcos where it's hardwired and then this gets mounted in the cabinet and it's kind of unwieldy to work on. See it had a few tears in it that have been repaired otherwise the speaker's in pretty good shape. So these two go to the field coil and these to the output transformer 
or rather that is the output transformer, those two go to the tubes. So it's also a little unusual. I'm used to the AC radios where uh, typically part of the Okay, speaker is hooked up. Radio is plugged in. And here we go. Oh, I just realized one thing I haven't done is reconnect the volume shaft. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I don't want to. Take the time to do that right now because it's going to take a little while. So I'm just going to turn up the volume manually underneath the chassis here. Working right, we should hear something. Okay, here we go. And bam. I got the voltmeter across the field coil again. Start hearing a crackle soon. Dead silence, dead silence. And uh, voltage is a bit lower than I expected. Alright, well. And now I want to start double checking things. First thing is, I get like, absolutely nothing out of the speaker, so I want to make sure that this is hooked up right and it's actually uh, hooked up right to that tube. And. I don't think I'll do. I'll do that. And I'm going to hook up that volume control shaft. You have to take this shaft off when you uh, take, this, uh, take the chassis apart to work on them. So, get that back in there. But what I should be able to do with this on is I can touch the caps of these tubes and see if there's a hum. And there's dead silence, pretty good indicator that there's something wrong near the output stage, otherwise you at least hear a little something. Yeah, absolutely nothing. So I'm thinking something isn't hooked up right in the output circuit. Okay, didn't find any obvious wiring errors. The Output transformer is wired incorrectly, and I measure 200 ohms DC resistance, which is correct. I've got my volume shaft extender installed. Let's give this another try. Put the back on here just to keep tabs on things. I haven't checked the tubes, but I do recall last time I powered the radio up, it was working. That's negative just because I have the leads reversed. This is a 6Q7, and that is the grid of the triode that drives the output tube. So you should most definitely get a hum by touching your finger right there, because it just gets coupled right over to the output to the speaker. So we've got something fundamentally wrong near the output. I will keep investigating. Uh, I suppose the next thing to do is just check some voltages. They don't give you it on every pin, but they give you enough for some basic troubleshooting. So there is the output tube, so I can check those voltages. And I also double check that well, that cap is in place. I think it's inside of a Bakelite block. And I want to check the plate voltage on that 6Q7, make sure. Let's get some juice going to it. Oh, 
Well, I think I found the problem. Certainly found a problem, and it's a pretty significant one. I knew it had to be something fundamentally wrong. These two tubes are in the wrong position. I wonder if anybody out there had noticed that before I did. And uh, it just so happens that they have the same filament pins, and they must have compatible enough internal structures that the, the audio output tube was acting somewhat like a rectifier and that this wasn't causing any drastic problems. Alright, let's give this a whirl. Again, DC meter across the fuel coil. Hey, we got a crackle out of the speaker. More than that, there's even a little bit of garbled sound. So, somewhat dangerous. All right. <laughs> I like it when it's that simple. I feel a little foolish for making such a fundamental mistake, but I'm glad I don't have to spend hours troubleshooting this either. Let's see, what band do you suppose I'm in? I think this probably shortwave. Oh, yeah. I was just guesstimating that because the lowest frequency channel would be, I would think, when the plates are in the most, and that should be AM560. Oh yeah, okay. I think that's what this is. There's another little problem I've noticed, that there's a little bit of a hitch right near the end of the dial, right about here. The knobs kind of slip. I don't know if it's a problem inside the vernier drive, or in the gears up front, or, uh, well, I can't find anything rubbing down there, but it's right there. It could very well be a little bit of dirt on one of the ball bearings. I've had that problem before. I wish you to solve it, I'd tear the whole thing apart. But the rest of it uh, has nice smooth action across the whole dial. And really, there really any stations down there, so I'm inclined to just leave it for now. And after all the work I did, I'm sure this needs an alignment. I'm just going to try doing a real quick and dirty one by ear to see if gain improves just by touching these up. That's pretty good. This doesn't sound very good. Yeah, I guess it's okay. Tone controls working. I'm just hearing a lot of background noise, but it could very well be because of my environment. There's one thing I've noticed on radios in the past is that the greatly improved one I put bypass caps across the AC line, either right across the AC line or from the AC line to ground, but notice this does not have any. So the end might be getting a lot of noise in here. Um, since this doesn't really have a ground reference chassis, uh, perhaps it'd be simple enough just to put one right across the AC line. I'll put it on the other side of the switch so it's not always on the AC line. Let's see if that helps out. See, like, there's noise right here in between stations. There's Really unpleasant. Here it is the next day, and reception is still really, really noisy. 
change around the chassis doesn't make much difference. Still have effort a line bypass cap. Well, by way of comparison, here's, here's a Philco 3810, which has been fully restored and does have a line bypass cap. And considerably less noise on the same station. So I'm going to try tacking one in and let's see if it helps. I installed one of these guys, Y2X1, so it's rated for both one side of the AC line to ground and uh, right across the line. That's not hooked in just yet, it's only attached on one side. I want to get the radio powered up and hear that sounds. And I'll clip it in. Hmm. Well, that's a huge difference. Now there is one other difference. On this radio, I have a fairly short antenna. On this one, I've got a really long antenna, so let's try shortening that. Well, certainly cuts the gain down. Just gotta have the volume cranked up all the way now. Well, before I get too bogged down in that issue, I'm going to go through and do a full alignment.